I think that's, is that clear? Yep, good. I've got a microphone here, something in my pocket here, something in my back pocket here. I have a feeling that if I cough, my heartbeat, temperature and any current diseases will be revealed to the whole audience. So uh, I'll avoid coughing. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, and, and congratulate Compass Publishing today. Uh, they, they are sponsoring my uh, trip to Japan and my attendance at this conference. Uh, Compass has done a, a lot for language teaching in East Asia. Um, and most people don't realize how much Compass Publishing has done, but one example is that I wrote a couple of books last year which were published this year, and one is for sale, but Compass Publishing kindly agreed that the second book would be worked on and formatted by their very skilled design team and made, abate, uh, made available free on the web for anybody who wants it. And so that's part of the contribution that Compass make that people often don't realise. I'd like to thank the Extensive Reading Foundation as well. Uh, I'd also like to say a few words about Rob Waring, but I can't uh, because I'm uh, being recorded at the moment. <laughs> Uh, but the Extensive Reading Foundation has done a tremendous job and uh, I'm so proud to see the progress of the association and also the amount of work. But the, the members of the board of the Extensive Reading Foundation, with the notable exception of me, and I'm not being modest, do enormous amounts of work and that work is apparent at this conference. Today I want to talk about, uh, I want to try and settle an argument uh, there's, there's been an argument going on largely between uh, Tom Cobb and Stephen Krashen about learning from input. And the argument basically uh, says, uh, Tom started it off and uh, Tom said, look, we, sh we should know whether it's possible to learn enough vocabulary simply by reading or not. Because we have the technology, we should be able to find this out. And then so Tom wrote an article looking at whether it would be possible to learn sufficient vocabulary for using the language simply through reading. And his conclusion was, it is not possible. And he was really attacking a statement and a position taken by Steve Crash. So McQuillan and Krashen replied saying, no, no, we think you're wrong. It is possible to learn enough vocabulary for language use through reading. Um, and so uh, I decided to look closely at this argument and then to, when I did look closely at the argument, I realised that they, they were arguing about completely different things. So Tom was looking at extensive reading and saying, worked out doing a kind of corpus-based study and worked out that because second and foreign language learners didn't have very fast reading speeds and because the texts were so difficult for them because of their low vocabulary levels, it's not possible to do enough reading. And so Tom's argument is based on the difficulty idea. It's just too difficult for learners to read enough material to get enough input. Steve Krashen, on the other hand, is simply looking at the quantity perspective and saying if the material is at the right level for the learners, then you can get enough input through uh, extensive reading. So, uh, having seen then that they're really arguing about two quite different things, then I decided to separate these two things and put the difficulty issue aside. I'll come back to it briefly at the end of this talk. So I put the difficulty issue aside and simply, simply asked the question, 
if the material is available at the right level for the learners, how much reading would learners have to do to meet enough repetitions and enough words from the first 9,000 words of English in order to have a chance of learning those words? Oh, what a long research question. <laughs> okay, so, so if you want to learn the first 9,000 words of English, how much do you have to read and is this feasible and possible? Okay. Now I understand the research question. Okay, so can reading contribute to vocabulary learning? If we, if we simply an analyse it according to the psychological conditions which are likely to occur during reading and we, which we know affect vocabulary learning, it's clear that these conditions occur. If you analyse the reading process, taking an approach like Laufer and Hulstein take in involvement load hypothesis, or like Stuart Webb and I take in technique feature analysis and simply say what psychological conditions are being set up by the reading process, then it's clear that the psychological conditions certainly could result in large amounts of vocabulary learning. The first of these conditions is repetition. That is, you have to meet the words several times in order to have a chance of learning them. And the number of repetitions that people need for learning is sort of like the holy grail of input theory. Uh, because there's really no answer to it, but people keep searching for the answer. But it's reasonably... Well, one thing you can say for certain is that the more repetitions, the more likely something will be learnt. And so that's, that's not greatly revealing, but it's still important. And so, just fairly arbitrarily, but with a little bit of research support, I decided that about 12 repetitions would be a reasonable number. Actually, Nor one of Norbert Schmidt's PhD students is doing really interesting research at the moment. What she's doing is they're using eye-tracking technology. And what they do is they put up a text and the student reads the text quietly and they track the eye movements while the student reads the text. And then when the student comes to a word that they know from pre-testing that the student doesn't know, they measure the fixation time on that word. And then the learner gets the meaning of that word and then when they meet the word again, and so they're trying to find out how many times does the student meet the word before they process it at the same speed as the words that they know. And th this is fantastic research because you're one step, it seems, closer to what's actually happening in here by measuring these eye fixation times. The presence re results, because she hasn't finished the study, suggest about seven times. So that by the time you've fixated on the word, met it seven times during reading, then your fixation time is about the same as for words that you already knew before you started reading. So that, this is very exciting research, and I'm sure knowing Norbert's thorough professionalism, we'll see an article published on this within a couple of years. Okay, the second condition which helps um, vocabulary learning is really adding, how would you say, adding quality to repetition, and that's called receptive retrieval. And receptive retrieval means you see the word and then you try to recall the meaning that you got for that word on the previous meeting. And so receptive retrieval is a, is a fairly shallow learning condition, but it is a good learning condition. Retrieval is a, is a good learning condition. A second condition is receptive varied use. I used to call it generative use and I'm moving away from that because it it's not very transparent, but it simply means that when you read graded readers, each time you meet a word that you hadn't met before, and then you meet it again, more often than not, the context of that word will be different. So some of my students at Temple University have done studies on graded readers to see when a word recurs in a graded reader, is it simply a repetition? I've got to be really careful because the, the Australian elections have just been on and uh, the, the now new Prime Minister made a terrible, a terrible uh, 
vocabulary mistake in, in one of his speeches. He said that he wasn't the suppository of all knowledge. <laughs> now, for the non-native speakers, a suppository is something that you stick up your medicine that you put up your backside. Um, I'm sure the opposition said that he was the suppository of all knowledge. But, but, uh, so I've got to be careful not to say things like that. So ignore the previous statement. <laughs> the repository of all knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> I think for the rest of my life, I'll never be able to say repository and suppository <laughs> without sure which one I'm getting correct or not. And then another condition which leads to good vocabulary learning from reading is deliberate attention. And deliberate attention occurs when a word is looked up in a glossary or it's looked up in a dictionary or the learner makes a deliberate attempt, say, to write it on a vocabulary card or something like that. And all of these conditions can occur very readily during extensive reading. Okay. Now, is it feasible to be able to read enough, to get enough input, to learn vocabulary at the various 1,000 word levels? So the assumption I'm making is this. We have 1,000 word lists which in, of decreasing frequency. The assumption is learners generally learn words from the most frequent words to the least frequent words. There are exceptions to this, and it's not a perfect relationship by any means, but it's still a reasonably well-supported assumption. So that's my assumption. If you wanted to learn the second 1,000 words of English, this is table one, you would need to read 2,000 tokens of language. Now, 2,000 tokens is the equivalent of two not-so-long native speaker novels. Okay? So in one year, you would have to read the equivalent of about two native speaker novels. If you were reading at a reading speed of, of 150 words a minute, and that's, that's just a moderate reading speed. It's by no means, no means a... A, a fluent reading speed. A fluent reading speed is probably about 250 words per minute and a reasonably fast one is about 300 words per minute. So I'm not making big assumptions for speed here. So reading at 150 words per minute, you would need to read for 33 minutes a week. Okay? So in order to get 12 repetitions of words at the second 1,000 word level, you would need to read for 33 minutes a week, five days a week, 40 weeks of the year. So it's not, I'm only using a school year and I'm only using a working or a school week. So this works out in brackets in column three of table one, seven minutes per day. So this is easily feasible. If you wanted to meet almost all of the words in the second 1,000 words of English and meet them on an average of 12 times, you would need to read seven minutes per day, five days a week for 40 weeks of the year. Easily done. Okay, it gets harder. Okay, my question to you. If you wanted to learn the fifth 1,000 words, yeah? So you already know 4,000 words of English and you want to learn the fifth 1,000 words of English, how many words would you have to read? How many minutes would you have to read per day? Have a chat with your neighbour, see if you can see the answer in table one. <laughs> I haven't been a teacher for 45 years to do all the work. Okay, come on, have a look. I'm going to ask you for the answer. So, the, so how many minutes per day would you have to read in order to learn the fifth 1,000 words of English? Come on, folks, it's easy. What do you reckon? Come on in. You look confident. <laughs> so you probably got it wrong. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> five doubles. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying 33 minutes per day. So it's uh, so, three, five novels in a week. Maybe. Fifth 1,000. Fifth 1,000, yeah. yeah. So that's a million tokens, and a million tokens is about 10, 10 not so long novels. 10 novels about 150 pages or so long, yeah? 
So how many minutes per day? 33. 33. Yeah, about half an hour a day. 33 minutes a day. So that's pretty good. Yeah? It gets harder because if you want to learn the ninth 1,000, then you would need to read for 40 days, 40 weeks of the year, five days a week, you would need to read for one hour, 40 minutes a day. That's getting less feasible, but it's, it is, it's still possible. It's still possible. Now, this is simply assuming that this is the only input you get. It's, it's simply reading input. It's forgetting about listening. It's forgetting about deliberate study. It's forgetting about fluency development. All of those sorts of other aspects of a course. But it's simply focusing on the amount of reading input that you would read. So I think Stephen Krashen is right. I think that it is feasible to meet the vocabulary at each of the high frequency and mid frequency levels. So the high frequency levels are 1,000 to 3,000 and the mid frequency levels are 4,000 to 9,000. And, it's so it's, and these words give you a total of 98% coverage of unsimplified text. So the reason we now distinguish mid frequency words from other words is because this bunch of 6,000 or so words will bring most readers readers of most material up to the level where they can read unassisted and have over 98% coverage of the words in a novel. So Tom's wrong, Steve's right. <laughs> well, Tom's not completely wrong because he was talking about difficulty. And so I think he is wrong because there is a lot of graded readers, thousands of graded readers which go up to about the 3,000 word level. But you can see that there's clearly a big gap from the fourth to the ninth. But we're going to come to that. Okay. Now, just to show that I'm not being too optimistic here, Table 2 looks at further opportunities for learning and for strengthening. So that if you, if you learnt the words at the 3,000 level through reading and you met an average of 12, 12 repetitions... And then the next year, you're saying, well, I'm, going to, I'm assuming a 1,000 words a year. I'm being really ambitious here. But there's no reason to stick to that. And then say you say, now I'm going to learn the next 1,000. What about the ones that you already know? Will they come back often or not? And the answer is they will come back very often. Because in the next year, you have to do a bit more reading. Then, of course, you get many more repetitions of the words you've already met before. And so, if you look down columns 3 and 4 in table 2, you can see that the average, uh, sorry, out of 1,000, if you were reading at the 9,000 level, so this is a 3 million word corpus, and that corresponds with the bottom of table 1, you can see that you would meet almost all of the second 1,000, almost all of the third 1,000, uh, all but 55 of the 4,000 and so on, and the number of repetitions of these would be 171, 79, 58, 37. So you see that the later reading, of course, is really strengthening and giving many, many more repetitions. So certainly very feasible indeed. Okay. Uh, table 1, I've played with the figures a little bit. These are not precise figures, and they shouldn't be precise figures anyway, but they're easy to remember. And the reason they're easy to remember is it's 2,000 for second thousand, so two for two, 200,000, sorry, third thousand is 300,000, and then it goes up in half or 500,000 word jumps. So if you have to teach this stuff, folks, this is going to make it easier to teach because then you don't have to look at your paper and you say, well, each year it's another half million words more than you read last year. Okay. Is that okay? Any comments, questions, suggestions, criticism, praise? Go ahead. The one thing about the more you read, the more you learn, the rich get richer. So after reading a few million words, the number of times you need to meet a word to learn it could decrease. It's based on 12 times per word, right? Yeah. But you could theoretically say that that number would go down yes. after reading a lot more. 
it's yeah, good it's, it's a good comment. There's, there's sort of research on this, but it's... Uh, that is, does it become easier to learn words when you know more words? And it seems that it does, but there's, there's only little bits of research on that which really haven't been pulled together and properly looked at. Uh, but I think it, it is true that the more you learn, the easier it becomes. And so, once again, this is probably an under it was it? I'm being pessimistic rather than optimistic. Yeah, good. So Paul, yeah. The, the top ten kids, that, does that include the uh, same sense or different senses? Oh, uh, it'll probably be different senses because, uh, as I said, when words recur, they tend to occur in slightly different, at least slightly different contexts and sometimes bigger contexts. So it's more likely to be different senses than the same sense. Mark. The assumption, one of the assumptions here is that the 12, for example, of the first, uh, you know, the yeah. words, is that the 12 meetings will occur over a 40 week period, right? Yeah. Any research about whether or not that yeah. pace is sufficient or not, or whether mm -hmm. yeah. the speed at which those 12 meetings must occur? Must yeah, no, nah. no. Nah. I mean, ideally, those the spacing would be a bit, it would be a bit spaced. And ideally, the spacing would probably be, it'd be better if it increased. But I think you're never going to be able to deal with that as a teacher or a reader. You just, here's the book, this is what I'm going to read. And, you know, it's manipulation you can't do. But that could be a weakness of this. Could, you could argue that the 12 repetitions occurred in one book. And therefore, that's not as good as if they were spread across a pile of books. Yeah. 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 The 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 positive thing on my side is that I'm looking at doing daily reading and not saying, well, you do a bunch of reading in one day of the week, you know, another one. So it's spread, and so the chances of the repetitions being spread then are probably greater as well. Okay, moving right along, folks. Um, okay. How hard is it to read an unsimplified text? So, what I've been talking about then is texts which are written at the right level for the learners. Now, this is really preaching to the converted. It's really saying, look, you really need to have texts which are at the right level for the learners and adapted for the learners. But if you look at an unsimplified text, this is it a good idea if you're a learner of English, to pick up a book written for a native speaker and read it from the beginning to the end and learn all the words that you meet. It's a terrible idea. <laughs> and one of the reasons why it's a terrible idea is because of Zipf's law. And Zipf's law says around about half of the different words in any text will occur only once. And so if that text uses a vocabulary of, say, three or four thousand different words, then about one and a half thousand of those different words will only occur once in the text. And Zipf's law is reasonably true. It, 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 sort of, it is like that. Um, so that's one reason. But another reason is the density of unknown words. If you knew only 2,000 words of English, this is table three on the other side, then there will be one unknown word in every eight words for you. So if you have a 2,000 word vocabulary and you pick up an unsimplified text and read it, there'll be more than one unknown word per line on average. And then in a book, now I put here a typical unsimplified novel, Captain Blood. Okay, <laughs> I am the greatest swordsman in all of France, Captain Blood, uh, Raphael Sabatini, one of the great classics. Um, that's, that's, that's around just over 100,000 words long. So I picked that text because it was the sort of average length of a novel. There would be 3,441 unknown words in that book for you. So as you, with a learner with a vocab of 2,000 words, struggled your way through that book, you would either have to look up, guess, or give up on 3,441 words. And if you were a learner with a vocabulary of 5,000 words, and you picked up the book, 
there would be one unknown word in every 22 words, one unknown word in every two lines, and there would be almost 2,000 unknown words in the book for you. So, reading unsimplified text is a cruel and unusual punishment. So, the Americans in the audience, you're, you're immediately prohibited from using unsimplified text with learners who uh, have a vocab size below about eight or 9,000 words. So, Table 3 simply shows you how tough it is to read unsimplified text and how lucky learners of English are that we have graded readers and books which are adapted to the learner's level. Okay. The best opportunities, when I looked at the amount of input needed, I thought, well, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, Tom and Steve were talking about written text. But what would provide the best input in terms of meeting words and repetitions of words? Would it be a mixture of spoken and written text? Would it be a mixture of formal or informal text? Which ones would allow learners to meet the most words and to meet them most often? And so, Table 7, which I won't spend a lot of time on, but it's, uh, I looked at various spoken language combinations, movies, novels, and so on. And the number of word families, which uh, at the top is in journals and novels. If learners read a mixture of journals and novels, and journals are sort of, um, how would you say, they're magazines, the, oh, I've forgotten the name of it. There's a e, 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 e. No, some kind of website where they put current affairs and summarize things. E zines or? E zines. Eh? E zines. Yeah, e zines. I'll, I'll see one one day. Okay. <laughs> um, they provided the best number of meetings with words with out of 9,000. If, if you. If you um, read two million, or met two million tokens, you would meet almost all, 8,631 of them. The worst one is at the bottom, where if you only had spoken input, then you would only meet just over 6,000 words of the first 9,000. And in general, the sort of conclusion is that it's best to have a mixture of spoken and written input, because this will provide the best kind of opportunity to meet the words. Spoken language tends to use a not so large vocabulary as written language, and, uh, but though the repetitions tend to be a bit higher. Novels only, uh, about two-thirds of the way down, you'd meet about 8,000 of the first 9,000 words. Movies and novels, 8,276. Now, really, th this is my justification for life. I love reading novels and I love watching movies. So I'm doing the right thing for my vocabulary. Okay, good. Now let me finish by looking at uh, the gap between high frequency words and reading unsimplified text. Graded readers go up to the 3,000 word level, roughly. But in order to get 98% coverage of the words in most texts, you need a vocabulary of around about 9,000 words, eight or 9,000 words. For spoken language, children's movies, you can do it with about 6,000 words. So if you want to understand, oh sorry, if you want to understand most of the vocabulary in a children's movie like Shrek or Toy Story or The Lion King, then you need to have a vocab of about 6,000 words. Uh, if you want to be able to read a novel and only have two or about six unknown words on a page, 2%, you need to have a vocab of about 9,000 words. And these figures are reasonably stable. So there's a big gap then, but when someone finishes the graded reader series at the 3,000 level and then go to unsimplified text, which really requires a vocab size of around about eight or 9,000 words. So to deal with that, we've created what we call mid-frequency readers. And mid-frequency readers are books which are adapted for learners who have a vocabulary of 4,000 words, 6,000 words, or 8,000 words. So what we've done is to take books which are out of copyright and then 
run them through a program which is called Ant Word Profiler, which Lawrence Anthony uh, very ingeniously and, and kindly worked on, which makes the adaptation of such text really quite easy now. With the Ant Word Profiler program, I can adapt a text in about a third of the time it used to take me before that program. The program's free and it's on the web, so if you want to look at it and adapt it, use it for adapting text for your classes, it's there for all to use. Uh, and so what we did was we took each text, adapted it to the 8,000 word level, so that means we left the words at the 9,000 and 10,000 word level in there because they are the new words to learn for somebody who knows 8,000 words. And then all the words from the 11,000 onwards we took out. Uh, at first, I, when we did this, I thought we would aim for 2%, getting 98% coverage of, of the novels within the learner's knowledge. It turned out that this wasn't the way to do it. And the reason was that if, you, if someone read with 98% coverage, there would still be over a thousand unknown words in the novel. So that 2% unknown would be over a thousand different unknown words. So we actually adapted so there's only about four or five hundred unknown words in each of the texts. So that's really closer to 99% coverage rather than to 98% coverage. But it was clear it, wasn't, it would be too heavy a burden if you read a novel and there were a thousand words that you might want to look up in the dictionary or gloss as you went along. So we adapted then adapted text at the 8,000 level and then save it and then carry on and readapt the text to the 6,000 level, save it and then readapt it to the 4,000 level. So that for each of the texts we have three versions of the text for learners with a 4,000 or a 6,000 or an 8,000 word vocabulary. At present, I think we have about nine texts on my website. They're free. Anybody can get them and use them for reading. And so these are for learners who are, was it, too old for Mother Goose and too young for Lolita. Uh, that's what Peter Sellers used to say, I think. <laughs> so, so people who've moved beyond the graded reader level but still want to have some reading which is at the right level for them. The goal is to get 50. And once we get 50, then we'll probably stop. Another reason that we might stop is that it's a waste of time. <laughs> um, and the reason why it might be a waste of time is that maybe learners don't need texts adapted at this kind of level. The thing which leads me to think that they do need them adapted is that if they're not adapted, then table 3 says... You know, if you know 4,000 words and then you pick up an unsimplified novel to read, there will be 2,383 in Captain Blood anyway, unknown words. That makes me think it probably is worthwhile. But it's still, there still remains to be research done on this. The interesting thing with the adaptations is that um, the adaptations don't change the novel very much because you're only changing a few words on each page, but it's different words on each page that you're changing. And, it, and if the adaptation is done carefully, then there's no, no grammatical change or anything like that. So, so the adaptations are not too far away from the original text. We have a policy of trying to have a mixture of factual texts and fiction texts. So the factual texts include things like The Art of War by Lao Tzu, um, uh, glimpses of Unfamiliar Japan by Lafcadio Hearn um, 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 and I can't remember the other ones um, but the idea is to try and get about 50-50 factual and, and so on text I've, I've got an ambition to put up uh, Origin of Species by Darwin I've just been reading that and I think that that can be reasonably adapted too within that level. I had an idea once, it would be a great idea to have a set of graded readers which took some of the classic books of the world, like The Prince by Machiavelli. That's on my website. Uh, I adapted The Prince to about the 2,000 plus academic wordless level once and then decided 
It was actually a boring book. Uh, but it's actually a very important book because Machiavelli's Prince is really important in political science, in literature, because it influenced the themes of Shakespearean drama and things like that. And it's interested uh, in it. And also, th there's about three or four subject areas where the Prince is an important text for people to read. And so the, uh, maybe I'll pick up that idea again and then we'll try and get books which are really important that we can then adapt so that they become reasonably easy to read. The interesting thing with books like The Prince and The Art of War is that these are not really simplifications because they are translations anyway. And so now the translation is done at a level which is suitable for learners with different vocabulary sizes. So in a way, I don't think they will suffer from the criticism. Those books sort of suffer from the criticisms of being simplifications. Okay. So, if you are interested in doing such adaptations, then uh, what we do is we put the name of the adapter on the book and it goes up and they're all available free. So anybody interested in, in trying their hand at doing an adaptation, please send me an email. We've got about four or five people who are doing them at present. And the idea is that once we get to the 50, the reason for going for 50 is that 50 books would give us somewhere around about 4 million running words. And the 4 million running words would easily give people choice if they wanted to learn the ninth 1,000 words because you need 3 million running words in order to learn the ninth 1,000 words and get enough repetitions. So that's the logic behind aiming for 50. Okay, I'm prepared to take questions for a few minutes and uh, or comments. I'll run this around first. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my name is Greg uh, Brooks English. I'm a professor here at Yonsei in the College of English, and I use extensive reading uh, extensively here in our program. And uh, one of the problems with my students that I find is that they come into the program and they only have about 24 hours of uh, reading and writing before they're released into academia um, as a freshman. And uh, one of the tragedies of English education in Korea is that the students have about 10 years of English education, and when they come, uh, pro probably, I'm, I'm talking more average students, not so much elite students, but the average students, you know, you say, hello, how are you? And they say, I am fine, thank you, and you. <laughs> and then it's finished. Or, you know, it kind of uh, stumbles onward. And uh, so, one of the things, and I'm so happy that um, Korean professors are here for, that represent Korean education as a whole, um, is that, you know, you're applying this as a 40 week, uh, can you do this, how many minutes can you do over 40 weeks? And I'm really curious about how you can introduce this in the elementary school level, starting in grade one, and moving through elementary school to middle school, even maybe first year high school, so that those 40 weeks could easily be accomplished hmm. by your comments. Um, there are people more qualified than me here to comment on that, I think. But let, let me give you an example of a school in New Zealand. This is not a primary school, but a secondary school. So we've, we've been running around New Zealand doing vocab testing of secondary school students, native speakers, to see their vocab size. One of the schools we went to spends tw the whole school, after lunch, sits down for 20 minutes and reads. They read quietly. And they do that every day of the week, every week of the year, every week of the school year. Now, um, the, the headmaster is, or the, sorry, the principal, isn't it, is sold on the idea? The rector. The rector, yeah, the rector. Yeah, this is a pretty, pretty fancy school. But in a way, that's, that's really what needs to happen. Now, the material is there. The, I mean, the compass graded readers, you know, now the Reading Oceans for very young kids and are suited to young kids, uh, the topics that they're interested in, everything like that. The material is all there. All it does is to take the will for teachers to say, let's spend a few minutes each day in class. 
Now, Atsuko Takasi, who is here, one of the, one of the really exciting findings from research he, she's done is that you really need to do extensive reading in class time initially because learners often don't do it outside class time and so they have to be forced to do it. But the success, the feelings of success which come from having been forced to do it and then find, gee, I read a book from the beginning to the end, I actually enjoyed it, uh, that's, that's, that's really important. Now another thing which is getting away from it a little bit, but I don't know if Akio Furukawa is here, but I, I, I keep, I, I'm advertising his language school in Japan, but he, he's got a very unusual language school. 80, the students come for three hours per week, and they pay a lot of money for the year. And half, 80 minutes of those three hours, they sit down and do extensive reading. The teacher who is being paid, and the parents of the of the students are paying for this, sits there quietly and gets on with a bit of record keeping and things like that. And the students read for 80 minutes. Now this school is making a lot of money. It really is. You know, he took me to his school and I, you know, I didn't, when I first met him I thought he was one of the teachers. And then I was walking along and someone who was with us said, oh that's Mr. Furukawa's building there. And that's Mr. Furukawa's building there. And I thought, holy smoke, this is the middle of Tokyo and he owns buildings and these are paid for by the language school. So he's managed to convince the parents through the result, the examination results, that simply getting these kids to sit down quietly. And you say, well, why don't they do it at home? Too many other distractions. When I was there, he asked them, how many of you do reading at home and so on? Put up your hand. How much reading do you do at home? Some of them did quite a lot at home, but many of them just did a few minutes at home. And so in a way, it's coming to the school. Is that The other 80 minutes are sort of conversation type activities and so on. But some students can choose to do two 80 minute sessions of extensive reading for their three hours. And some choose that. So I think it's simply the will and the opportunity by providing the books. Another, another good example of this is the book flood study by Elian Mungabai in Fiji. In the, book, uh, the book flood study was done in rural Fiji with the children of very poor children, uh, families. These are the cane cutters in Fiji. And they studied English for four classes a week, a bit under an hour for each class. And so all they did was have a book flood in some schools where they provided each class with 200 really nice books. And then they said, you've got to spend three of the four classes, the equivalent of three of the four classes of English reading and the other class the teacher can teach. In nine months, the experimental group had made 15 months progress compared to the control group who just went with a normal teacher fronted program. They went back a year later and the gains were still maintained a year later. So it's, it's easily possible to do and it just requires the materials and the will to do it. Okay, good. Hi, could I just ask, my name's Kat. Where are we? Oh, I, sorry, okay. Yeah, uh, I have, my students, university students, they read three hours a week. They're doing extensive reading. Wow. And so if you're, you're doing that with information here, it's all based on 150 words per minute. Yeah. Do you feel like that's the average student? Because my students just don't believe they can read 150 words a minute. And I don't know how much to push them. Is that like some No, magic? you so should. If they're only reading 50 words a minute, but they're reading, is it important to keep pushing them to get that speed? No. What I would do in your, your circumstance is I would give them a targeted speed reading course. Now, there are free speed reading courses available. Yeah, free. And so on my website, there's one free one. And then on Sonia Millett, M-I-L-L-E-T-T, -T, Sonia with an I, on her website, there are three or four free speed reading courses. Compass Publishing has reading for speed and fluency at the 500, 1,000, 1,500 and 2,000 word level. And I would give a targeted speed reading course. Because the gains, the speed gains, which are made from a targeted speed reading course, which takes about f between five and ten minutes each session for 20 sessions. And the normal increase you would expect 
would be at least a 50% increase in speed, and some learners will double their speed. There's an article that um, um, Teresa Chung and I published in a journal in Korea, of a study in Korea, with uh, doing this with Korean learners, and they made this 50% increase on average, and uh, some of them doubled their reading speed. You should expect at the end of a speed reading course that learners should be reading around about 250 words per minute. Now you can increase reading speed through fluence through extensive reading, and as some of the papers at this conference will show, I think uh, David Begler and Alan Hunt's paper shows that you get fluency increases through doing extensive reading, but you get bigger fluency increases faster by doing a targeted speed reading course. The speed reading course is simply passages, questions on the back, learners read the passage, note down the time, answer the questions, mark them themselves, put the speed on the graph and their score on the graph, and then next day do it again, and so on. So that's what I'd be doing there. It was a e perfect example of what's called the experimenter effect, or the Hawthorne effect. Because each one of these students who were identified in the first four reading speed of the first four texts, were then, we interviewed them one by one and said, oh, no, no, you know, you're reading, are you translating what you're reading, so on like that. Everybody increased their reading speed. The attention given to these students made them take the course more seriously, and so we spoilt the experiment because everybody increased their reading speed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go on this one. Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask about deliberate, you mentioned as a condition for learning, yep. deliberate attention. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of different ideas of what an uh, L2 learner should do when they encounter an unknown word. Um, you mentioned looking it up or glossing it. How, where do you come out on that? Deliberate learning is extremely important. I'm, I'm in favor of rote learning. I'm in favor of bilingual word cards where the word is on one side and the translation on the other. Uh, one of the most important pieces of research in my field of vocabulary in the last 20 years has been done by one of our PhD students. And she showed that Steve was wrong this time, Steve Krashen. She showed that deliberate learning results in both implicit and explicit knowledge. Uh, the study has been published in Language, Language Learning in 2011, I think it is, and uh, Irina Elgort, you can read that study. So Steve's wrong because he said deliberate learning doesn't give you the kind of knowledge you need for normal language use. You need implicit knowledge. Well, her study showed in three separate experiments that deliberate learning results in both implicit knowledge and explicit knowledge at the same time. Implicit knowledge is subconscious, well integrated with the language system, and to some degree fluent. So I'm very strongly in favour of it. But it's only one of the options, not the options, it's one of the ways which should be in a course, but not the only way in a course. It needs, you need to have both, both kinds of learning. Hi, um, my name is Sang Bok Sa, and I um, teach a virtual language and literature at Tango University. Uh, I have actually two questions uh, regarding the, 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 the table one. You yeah. said our goal is 50,000 words, right? But um, your table one shows a one year period of learning 9,000 new words. No, no, but no, no, no. The goal, the, go the goal is to learn 1,000 words a year. Yes. So yeah. uh, the ultimate goal is 50,000. No. After that, you're going to waste the time, right? Because you 9,000. The goal is 9,000. 9,000? Yes. But 50, what was the number of uh, 50,000 at that uh, number of time? No, I, I, uh, no. 50 books. Or oh, 50 books, was it? Uh, maybe I didn't. Yeah, 50, bo 50 books would be 500,000 uh -huh. tokens. Okay, so, so the goal is 9,000 words. In the university education, uh, we are usually teach for four years, right? So uh, if the goal is 9,000, then after one year, it's just full reading, or is there any, any other guide to enlarge our vocabulary? 
That's my oh, no, no. question. I'm, I'm not saying that you, you should only learn through reading. Mm -hmm. I'm just exploring the idea whether reading will give you the opportunity yeah, to do this thing. Yeah, question is as far as the reading is concerned. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, well, well, there should be other kinds of learning through listening and speaking and reading. Listening and speaking and writing, and there should also be deliberate learning going on, and there should also be fluency development going on. But I'm only looking at the reading aspect. Okay. Second question is quite different. Uh, since I'm teaching Russian language and literature, do you have any research uh, or the outcome of research uh, concerning literature? Not English language, but the other foreign languages. No. Is there any whole research project? I, I wish there or was. To yeah, I wish there was. I wish there were graded readers in other languages. You know, people tell me that there is, and then you see about three or four little books. You know, I, there are some in Japanese, but you know, the whole pile of them is about that thick. And there's some in French that I've seen, but once again, about five or six books. The other languages have to get 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 moving. Some kind of yeah, yes. yeah, thank yeah. Thank you very much. I Good. Thank you. Good. And I. Oh. Time for just one more question. One more, okay. Uh, my name is Astro Sakasek. Oh! <laughs> I'm teaching at uh, in university right now, but there's a problem about access. Uh, we've been talking about the uh, JERA, Japan Extensive Reading Association, but some students start reading fast but without comprehension. Yeah. So, even the, this, well, <laughs> this morning session, um, I've heard that the comprehension and the speed does not go relate. Yeah. So mm. sometimes some of those problems that they just so what, skip, skip for us, yeah. they don't know. But is there any good suggestion for them to uh, increase the speed as well as comprehension? Well, all good speed reading courses measure both speed and comprehension. And so, and I, I think it'd be foolish to do a speed reading course which only measured speed. <laughs> it's, it's, it, no, but, but, you know, because the, the, the reading texts are accompanied by questions. The questions are deliberately easy so that learners are not encouraged to slow up and read in a painstaking way. Um, th this is a concern. It's a concern that people have with graded reading. That, you know, what, how do I know if the learners really understand the book that, I, you know, that they're reading? All I can say is, when I went along to the language school to look at these kids reading, who are not being tested on the books they read at all, if you want to sit for 80 minutes, going like that and not understanding a word, <laughs> get a life. <laughs> you know. Um, no, and my, my, so my response is that you have to make sure that as teachers you're not encouraging speed without comprehension. But my feeling is that once learners read with comprehension and then they can increase their speed with that, anyone who goes to reading without comprehension is, needs, needs a psychiatrist, not a teacher. <laughs> so, well, I mean, yeah, okay, I don't know. But, but, so all I'm saying is I think speed reading courses must have a comprehension element to them. There, there has been recent research which now measure what the effect of fluency is on comprehension, and there are small increases in comprehension shown as well. Uh, the reason the increases are small is because the comprehension tests are easy, and so there's a ceiling effect. And I have a feeling when we get into into more focused research on the effect of fluency on comprehension, we will find that there are probably reasonably substantial comprehension increases as fluency increases. Yeah. Thanks for that, that's good. Cool.